Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Raw Law Unfiltered with your host, the DUI guy, really, really red plus. Um, I just got off of another run. I've uh, been trying to kind of watch my weight recently. Um, I don't know. I felt like I started gaining more than I would like to. So I started watching what I eat slightly, but running more and being a little bit more active. So hopefully we can, um, you know, drop some of those pounds. I'm happy to report that in the short time that I have been uh, running, which has only been about like a week, less than a week, you know how in the beginning the weight loss is like extreme? Uh, I am happy to report I lost like six pounds in like five days, which I feel a lot of it might be like water weight. And, and the initial progress is always like a trajectory, like upward. And then it kind of slows down when you get to like pound eight, pound nine, pound 10, then it kind of slows down a little bit. But I, it's always my favorite when you start your weight loss uh, goals. And when you start your weight loss program, the initial loss is just so staggeringly fast. It's quite extraordinary. So I'm, I don't know, I'm just really, really happy. But um, today, uh, as you all know, I've been telling you that we're going to have a very special guest and she is backstage, which I'll bring her in in just a moment. Uh, her name is Claire Best. And I imagine she's British because she speaks with a slight uh, English accent from what I could detect. But what do I know? I'm just one guy. I'll let you be the judge. Uh, she is a filmmaker and in her past life was making a lot of documentaries. And now since the pandemic started, she has been uh, doing a lot of investigative journalism. But let's let's bring her on. Let her tell her story. We're going to be talking about the whole Stanford uh, debacle and what has led up to the Stanford debacle since 2007, 2008, at least. Uh, so without further ado, here she is. 2007, 2008, at least. You might want to turn off the stream in the background. I can hear myself talk. <laughs> How do I do that? I want to turn off the stream in the background. I can hear myself talk. If you just close the tab of the YouTube video, in the background, I can hear myself talk. Just close the tab. Just turn the sound off on it. That, that's fine too. Just mute it. All right, I'm gonna mute you for just a second. That's really, really hurting my ears. Can you hear me better? now? There we go. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, Hi. Claire. Hi, everybody. Uh, so uh, I'm Claire Bess. Thank you, Larry, for having me on your show. And uh, I'm very appreciative that you uh, found my article on Medium and that you decided to cover it about uh, Katie Myers and her uh, family's lawsuit against Stanford University. And uh, to tell you a little bit about me, I'm a film and television agent. I am British. I live in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm a mother. I have two daughters. Uh, college age daughters and uh, I uh, also you know work in the film and TV industry I have clients who work with Johnny Depp I don't know him personally but he's always had a great reputation and I hadn't really paid too much attention to the Amber Heard Johnny Depp uh, or Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard lawsuit actually until um, I think it was end of May June end of May 20. 20 or May 2021, when it became apparent that the ACLU had uh, been involved in creating the Washington Post op-ed um, against Johnny Depp that led to the lawsuit. And if you read, most people just concentrate on that lawsuit being attacking Johnny Depp. But there's a paragraph in that lawsuit that is about Title IX, which is mm. about campus discrimination on campus, uh, you know, discrimination against sex on, on campus. And that is the paragraph that got my attention because I started digging into it and I came to the conclusion that Amber Heard had essentially been recruited to smear Johnny Depp uh, in this 
um, letter and that she was doing it for the purposes of the ACLU who sometime afterwards joined up with an organization called Know Your Nine to sue the Trump administration uh, Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos um, against due process on campus. And uh, there are many things that I could say bad about uh, what I think about the Trump administration and Betsy DeVos, but there is one thing that she really did right, and that is address this issue of due process on campus. So what she did is uh, she withdrew a 2011 unregulated, meaning it didn't go through the re regulatory procedure, she withdrew an unregulated Title IX directive that essentially caused kangaroo courts all over the country, with thousands of people denied their due process rights, um, thousands of people who ended up um, being booted out of college, booted out of school, some of them facing criminal trials, um, some of them not able to sign up to another school, campus, university afterwards. And she rescinded that directive, went through the regulatory process, took 124,000 comments before um, putting in the Federal Register a new Title IX directive in uh, August 2020. The current administration, the Biden administration, is trying to undo the protections that she put in place. And Michelle Dorber, who helped draft the original unregulated Title IX directive, uh, has been fiercely against the new due process rights, along with all the organizations that are the so-called experts behind the Amber Heard letter of a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So, where does Katie Meyer fit into all this? So Katie, so Katie Meyer was the captain of the women's soccer team at Stanford, who was accused of um, throwing coffee or spilling coffee on a male football player at Stanford after that male football player had allegedly sexually assaulted. I think I believe it was an unwanted kiss, but sexually assaulted a uh, young woman on the female soccer team on Katie's soccer team when this girl was 17 years old, in other words, a minor. And uh, according to the lawsuit, which I've now had a chance to review completely, according to the lawsuit, the male football player um, was reported to the Title IX office, his uh, and to the police, I believe, and his mother and he had a meeting with Stanford, with the administrators, uh, with the coach, and uh, the, apparently the criteria were not met for any action against him to go further. Meanwhile, uh, Katie Meyer received this letter in September 2021 from the Title IX coordinator at Stanford, um, basically demanding that she respond to these allegations of spilling coffee. And there's a very, it's a very threatening paragraph. And um, if I can read it to you, uh, I think that um, it's, I don't know if you have it in front of you. I, I know I just sent it to you and of course I can't find it. But um, I can share a screen if you give me a moment. I can one share one it on our screen. Three. Give me just a moment. I have it right here. 143, right? Share it on our screen. Three. Yes. Give so, me just a moment. I have it right here. 143, right? Yes. I hear you share it on our screen. Three. Yes. So, Give me just a moment. I have it right here. 143, right? Yes. yes. I hear you share it on our screen. Okay. So, paragraph 143 is about this letter that uh, Katie Myers or Katie Meyer received in September 2021. And it reads, uh, it says, finally, subject to your right not to incriminate yourself, we expect you to respond to our communications and cooperate with the OCS, which is their judicial process, in a timely and professional manner. Failure to do so could result in further actions being taken by the university, including an enrollment hold being placed on your student account. Additionally, failure to respond to our requests in a timely fashion may result in the investigation proceeding without, sorry, in the investigation proceeding without the benefit of your participation. 
Well, to me, this paragraph is the most significant paragraph in the entire document because essentially what it says is that they want Katie to give a reply and explain herself for this accusation of spilling coffee. But they recognize that if she does explain herself, she might incriminate herself uh, if there was uh, you know, further action or, um, or it turned into a criminal case. And it's a damned if you do and damned if you don't. If you, if you don't respond, you're presumed guilty. And if you do respond, you can be found guilty later, which is what happened. So six months later, she, she did respond. She explained herself. Six months later, she received an email after hours telling her that uh, she had been found guilty of this, that they were um, holding back her degree and that a fair panel would find her guilty beyond reasonable doubt. And she had not had the opportunity to talk, explain, be asked further questions. This was the process. So to me, um, the very reason that Title IX was uh, invented in 1972 was actually to promote women's um, sports on campus. Katie Myers would not be at Stanford in the soccer team, recruited by Stanford for the soccer team, captain of the soccer team with a future in soccer if it had not been for that 1972 Title IX directive. And here we have the whole thing turned on its head and bastardized by this 2011 directive that was drafted by Michelle Dorba and this 2013 process, OCS they call it, uh, judicial process, which was um, uh, designed by Michelle Dorba from my understanding, that denied the very person it's supposed to protect against her due process rights and leading her to suicide. Right. And it is not as if Stanford had not been warned about the repercussions of this directive before. And so that is why I'm here, because uh, when we watch the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard trial and people saw it, you know, everything that was going on, and, they, and, and more importantly, they saw how the media rallied behind Amber Heard afterwards and essentially um, undermined the jury and the judge in the case we've ended up in a really scary position in our society that is refusing the assumption of innocence, is using kids in schools and colleges and universities as political pawns, and it is driving them to suicide. Katie is one of many, many, many. There are thousands. I think there are 12 in the last couple of years at Stanford. That is absolutely terrifying. I think there are 12 in the last couple of years at Stanford. Here, I'm hearing myself again. That is absolutely terrifying. I think there are 12 in the last couple of years yeah. at Stanford. Does it automatically keep unmuting itself? I'm trying to figure out what the issue is. Uh, you've muted yourself. I can't. I can't hear you now. Okay. Well. Anyway. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Um, just technological difficulties. Um, okay. Well. Anyway. I can hear myself again. Um, just technological difficulties. If you could just close that tab, we won't have to worry about it. I can hear myself again. Got it. Okay. Perfect. Um, so I have not had the luxury of going through the full complaint just yet. And now that you you have read it, we looked at the what you consider to be the most significant paragraph. Um, this is my my first question is, first of all, the email that was sent to Katie in uh, March or April before she uh, unlived herself. We try not to use the S word on my channel. In, uh, March or April before she uh unlived herself. We try not to use the S word. I can still hear myself. Uh, March or April before she uh, unlived herself. We try not Claire. to use the S word. I can still hear myself. Uh, March or April. 
Are you doing this on purpose? Be honest with me. Um, Are you doing this on purpose? Be honest. See, with that, me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. My my problem is is that when um, you speak, you I hear it, and now I'm hearing an echo on myself. <laughs> No, I'm not. My, my problem is, is the that joys of technological glitches. Okay, can you close like the tab where the YouTube no, is? Can you close it entirely? Like just delete it, exit out, destroy it, make it not exist. Can you close it entirely? Like well, now she, now she closed the stream yard. <laughs> This is the most frustrating interview I've had ever. But I'm sure this is not the first or last time we're going to have these issues. Um, she asked the wrong one. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> All right. Um, I'm just going to wait for her to to use the link to rejoin once again. Uh, I, I don't even understand, like, how is it possible? Because it, it gets muted and then, and, and then I, like, it's fine, it's all good. She's talking, we don't hear her, it's all fine. And then all of a sudden I start talking and it's fine. And then I continue talking and the sound like magically turns on. I, I can't, I can't even, uh, I, I can't even understand what is the technological issue, but hey, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Um, in the meantime, in the meantime, um, I, I was going to ask her a question. I was going to ask her a question about this lawsuit because I have not had the chance to read it. It's very lengthy. It's about um, there she is. All right, we're you closed the wrong one, Claire. You closed the stream yard on accident. Oh, oh dear! But it seems to be working now. There's no more echo. I, I think so. I think you got it. So here, here was my question. The email, so we have portions of the email that was sent on uh, September 17th, 2021. Do we have portions of the email, either through the complaint or some other source of the email sent, uh, I think by Michelle Dauber to Katie in March or April? Yes. Um, so what happened, so it wasn't Michelle Dauber that sent the, that email um as far as i i'm very sure it's not okay my point is that michelle dauber was instrumental in designing the process by which there was an assumption of guilt for innocence and the stanford judicial process so so michelle dauber designed the or designed the 2011 or was instrumental in designing the 2011 unregulated title IX directive that mm. went to all colleges universities schools that get federal funding from the department of education and she was chair of the ocs which is the stanford internal judicial conduct committee for students in uh, I think 2011 to 2013, in which this process of um, denying due process was enabled. And in 2011 to 2013, in paragraphs 225 to, uh, 222 to 225, you can see that there were complaints made by students at that time who were denied their due process rights and they were ignored. And that is referenced in the document. Okay. But we don't have copies of the email itself or citations to it as far as... Uh, that. No, there, there are. I'm afraid I can't tell you what those paragraphs are because I didn't pull those up before this, but there are those. She, okay. she received So she received a letter from the Dean of Students um, whose name I think is... Caldera, Caldera, something like that. She received a letter from the Dean of Students in February uh, 2021, so six months after that September letter. Mm -hmm. And she received the letter at the end of the day, I think at seven o'clock, something around then, after all the offices had closed. And the letter basically told her that they had found her guilty of spilling coffee and that um, her diploma, her degree, would be withheld. Um, Placed on hold, yes. Yeah, um, and that, uh, so she wouldn't be able to graduate. She was going to be graduating that summer. She was looking forward to going to Stanford Law School. She had hopes of, uh, you know, national soccer leagues. Um, she was a pretty high-flying student. And 
when she received that letter, she had she it, it, they found it open on her laptop mm-hmm. when they found her, and I'm and um, she had just been uh, on phone calls or zooms with her family. She'd been planning her spring break. She'd basically been happy. She was excited to travel, uh, and she had all these plans. And then they found her after she'd received this letter and uh, the letter was open on her laptop. And that was the the last thing that she has seen, presumably, before. That was the last thing that she saw. When she received the letter, she, this is all according to the lawsuit. When she received the letter, she emailed back immediately to say how distressed and distraught she was. And they gave her a day, three days later to meet. And that was too late. And they knew when they sent this letter to her that she had been suffering mentally, that she'd had, um, she'd been suffering acute mental depression before anyway. Uh, There's records of that in, in, in the, um, in the lawsuit. And so the whole situation was just callously handled with no regard to the recipient on the end of the email. And I think that's really my biggest issue with Michelle Dorber, with the Department of Education, with all the people that are behind Amber Heard um, who went after Johnny Depp, is they do not think about the people on the receiving end. They are people, they have souls, they have hearts, they have ambitions. Um, I'm generally an optimist and I think that especially on campus. I don't think that anybody sets out to do harm, that it is probably an accident. Um, And I think that they should be given the opportunity to defend themselves fairly instead of receiving this, you know, you know, frankly, like a fascist sort of uh, treatment. Um, That is, you know, it's a hostile environment and it's a hostile environment across across the nation. And, you know, what what do they get for this hostile environment? They get a lot of money. They get a lot of federal grants that, that support all of these nonprofits, all the nonprofits that are, you know, End Rape on Campus, Know Your Nine, ACLU, National Women's Law Center, the Women's March, you know, they're, they're, they're all getting, you know, fantastic grants. The, the, the universities themselves are getting Title IX grants and they're being threatened that if they don't follow these directives, their federal grants are going to be withheld. It's, it's pretty scary. It's more than scary. It's terrifying. I mean, like you, you said it, and I think I've already addressed this on my channel. And if I haven't, I'm going to address it now or address it again in the sense of the the Title IX directive essentially strips students of their constitutional rights, the right to due process, the right to retain counsel, the right to have a a trial by jury, if so elected, you know, uh, six if it's a misdemeanor, in most jurisdictions, 12 if it's a felony in all jurisdictions with a unanimous vote guilty or not guilty at the end of the day, all of that removed and replaced with, uh, your lawyer is replaced with an employee of the university who is judge, jury, and executioner, and who is, by the way, also paid by Stanford University in that case, or the university where they are a student and being accused in a different case. Um, The procedures are by an individual who travels the country and does a three to four day seminar teaching how to do it when uh, the majority of judges at least have not only three years of law school, but also five to 10 years of real life experience. So you're basically essentially replacing 12 to 15 years of experience minimum on the part of the judge with a two to three to four day training. Um, And the standard of proof which is beyond a reasonable doubt in all criminal cases in every state of the union is now replaced with this barely preponderance of the evidence, basically whatever I say goes type mentality on the part of the investigator slash judge slash executioner. And your entire career can go to hell in a handbasket based on a mere accusation with 
maybe a pure he said, she said uh, type of case. Am I correct so far? Uh, yes, you are correct. I mean, so so that is uh, Title IX. And as I said, in 2020, that was rescinded um, and replaced with a more fair um, uh, regulation for Title IX. But Stanford, in this instance, seems to have completely ignored that. So Stanford, in my opinion, reading reading this lawsuit, was ignoring the new federal directive that would require due process. Now, why would Stanford do that? Stanford would do that because um, Stanford, or a lot of people very closely associated with Stanford, their board members, Michelle Dorber, et cetera, are um, uh, very big democratic fundraisers. And Joe Biden, when he ran for, for president, he promised that he would rescind the, the regulations that it required due process. And in fact, in September 2017, Joe Biden himself was recorded saying that those who believe in due process on campus are like the Nazis marching on Charlottesville. It's pretty scary. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's very, it's very, it's very scary. And as I said, I, you know, I'm independent these days. I used to be a Democrat. I mean, I'm an independent because I cannot subscribe to students civil rights being denied yeah no i mean exactly so okay as of today i remember seeing an article uh that the department of education is looking into stanford university and their practices i imagine seems to be very directly related to the filing of this lawsuit um, I don't think, see, it's, it, it's the saddest part, um, it is action a lot of times, not just in this situation, but in all aspects of life usually doesn't get taken until either someone gets severely injured or a life is lost. And in this case, of course, we have the latter. So that is kind of painted the national spotlight on the whole issue um, Amber has already done it in her own right, uh, with showing that men can also be abused in the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial, which up until that point was a known concept, but wasn't really something that was explored in depth for understandable reasons. It's not, it's definitely not something that was on the front, on, on, on top of everyone's mind. And I think that was what Amber was counting on back in uh, not only 2016, but also in 2018, uh, as, uh, you know, if you follow her story, um, I just finished analyzing her deposition, uh, from, uh, August 13th, 2016 on my channel, all four parts can be found in my playlist, by the way, to our viewers. Um, I think it took time for her to really gain confidence in the fact that the system can be abused and there is no real retaliation that can, she thought, hurt her. She did not realize that she could, in fact, later on be sued for defamation and this will all come biting her in the ass. And she is going to literally change the way the public views um, abuse in the first place. And she thought she was completely uh, impenetrable and an, an unstoppable force. And uh, lo and behold, here we are. She she is even hiding in Spain to avoid all the lawsuits and counter lawsuits that are sparking from this. You know, she's suing her own insurance company, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, meanwhile, she uh, just filed her brief in her own appeal. She is going to submit her reply excuse me her response to uh johnny's brief tomorrow tomorrow is the deadline december 2nd then all the fallout from both of those is going to continue with the responses on both sides replies by the reverse side on both lawsuits so we have all of that to look forward to um but uh, with, can, can I, sorry i was yeah so so my feeling about the Amber Heard Johnny Depp case as it relates to all of this is that um, I want to divide it into two things. So whatever happened in their marriage 
and the accusations against that it sounded you know pretty horrible but they did have this agreement in august 2016 where they agreed that they weren't going to say negative things about each other and they were just going to go on their way in november 2016 amber heard appeared at the glamour awards women of the year awards and michelle dauber accepted a prize for emily doe who's emily doe Emily Doe is Chanel Miller, who wrote a book called uh, Know My Name. She is otherwise known as the victim of Brock Turner, who was the Stanford rape rapist, who was an Olympic hopeful swimmer, who, in my opinion, with substantial research, was framed by Michelle Dorber. And he was turned into the face of a campus rapist. Um, he was accused of being white, entitled, um, rich, you know, everything wrong about an entitled kid. In fact, the narrative was completely wrong. And Chanel Miller, who was his accuser, uh, she didn't want him to go to jail for a long time. Her family was an awful lot wealthier than his family. She was a friend of Michelle Dorber. She arrived on campus already drunk, already having been drunk, drinking. She went to campus specifically to uh, hook up fine guys um, and with her sister and her sister's friend. And she was 22, she was a non-student and she found Brock Turner at a frat party. There shouldn't have been alcohol at the frat party because it was on campus. He was 19 years old, he was a freshman. And uh, she went with her sister at one point or her sister's friend to uh, pee in the bushes and she removed her underwear and didn't put it back on again. She went back to the party, made out with Brock Turner. They left together and they were walking back towards his dorm when she fell down on the grass, pulling her, him with her and they made out. There were couples on each side. There wasn't a dumpster. There was a shed. There were cars all around. There were license plates. There were a lot of witnesses. Um, he got up to, because he didn't feel well, to go and relieve himself. And it is that point that these two Swedish, um, I think they were Swedish, bicyclists saw him, saw her lying on the ground, thought that he was escaping the scene. Um, he, he was arrested. He was like a deer in headlights. He didn't know what the issue was. He admitted to fingering her, but her DNA, his DNA was never found on her. And phot photographs were put on his phone and then disseminated of her unconscious on the ground. And she, she did lose conscious at some point, but nobody really knows when. So nobody knows if it was uh, during their encounter or after their encounter. And she admitted herself that she would get blind drunk to the point where people wouldn't realize that she was drunk. She was fully functional. She would drive home fully functional. Um, and so it was quite possible that she could be drunk without someone or very drunk without someone knowing it. But Michelle Dorber turned this thing into a political coup for herself. And the nation, including me, believed that Brock Turner was this terrible rapist. And it wasn't until December 2019 when uh, I met somebody associated with Stanford who'd really looked into the case, who gave me legal documents, various other pieces of discovery and so forth. And I realized that Brock Turner had been framed and that it was political. And that in June, on June the 1st, 2016, Amber Heard appeared on the front of People magazine as a victim of domestic violence. On the same day, Michelle Dorber leaked, or, or I believe it was the same day, she leaked the Emily Doe victim impact statement for Brock Turner's sentencing to the filmmakers of The Hunting Ground, which is a, a documentary about campus sexual assault that has since been debunked as propaganda. But she leaked it to, and, and the people who were financing that film were very, very closely associated with Stanford. So she leaked this this uh, um, 
um, Emily Doe victim impact statement to the filmmakers of The Hunting Ground, specifically to get it out into all the media channels before the sentencing was done, before Brock Turner had even heard it. And he heard it the next day. And then that victim impact statement became a sensation across the nation. And it led to Congresswoman Ann Custer saying, we are all Emily Doe and introducing this bipartisan workforce to tackle domestic violence and sexual assault, which then unleashed millions of dollars in more federal grants and so forth. Um, but a 2019 Freedom of Information Act um, request from a journalist in Santa Clara County where this, where this trial happened, revealed that Michelle Dorber was colluding with the DA's office behind the scenes of the Brock Turner trial, and that in fact she was using it and using the sentencing in order to call a, to call a recall for Judge Aaron Persky, which happened in 2018. And she later admitted that she had um, managed to get California minimum sentencing laws changed on the back of this. So, so a tenured law professor from Stanford is essentially rigging a criminal trial to, to oust a judge for political purposes. And then she called when, when Brock Turner appealed his case, which every citizen has the right to appeal, she um, used social media to call for extreme violence. And this group of feminists answered it and showed up in Ohio, where he lives with his family, outside their door, carrying AR-15 automatic weapons, threatening to kill him. This, this is how dangerous she is. Wow. Um, so, so, so yeah. when she went, so when she went after, um, when she went after uh, Johnny Depp and Johnny Depp's followers and Camille Vasquez, you know, and she, I mean, she was really misogynistic about Camille Vasquez and racist. Yes. Um, and then, you know, there was a tweet that a student at Stanford had asked her about something and she reminded them that the world of sexual violence politics is small and that she advised them to shut up. Yes. Essentially a veiled threat that she was gonna frame them as well. And th this, yes. is, this is how scary it is because she is extremely closely tied to the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights and therefore the federal grants and funding that are going to all these schools. So we may now have another insight into why Michelle Dauber throughout these past few months has been such, uh, well, it just has been so vile. And the reason is she has a very vested, personally vested interest in protecting her own assets, because if this gets exposed, she is going to be one of the central pins, if you will, um, that is once once the veil is lifted, her name is going to be front and center, basically. And yes. it's going to be a huge problem because it's not all kosher. Basically. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I think it actually is going to be front and center quite soon on mm -hmm. the mayor versus um, Stanford lawsuit, the Katie Mayer family's lawsuit. Uh, she's not named in the lawsuit, but the um, OCS, the judicial uh, is and that's and, and the period when she was running it. And there is a listing of Jane and John Doe's one through 25. And I have a suspicion that she will end up being near the top of those Jane Doe's one through 25. So and for people who are not familiar with what that means, um, when you file a lawsuit as a plaintiff's attorney, you name everybody that you can think of off the top of your head who you believe may have direct involvement in the lawsuit, the civil lawsuit that you are pursuing for monetary damages. Sometimes, as in this situation, there may be other key players that you do not know who they are yet, but the discovery process will show who they are. So in order to protect the rights of your client, make sure that you, if you accidentally did not name a particular defendant, 
Um, there is a very simple tool that every plaintiff can use, and that is naming a Jane Doe or a John Doe that can later be filled in with a name. If you fail to do that, that's, I think, borderline malpractice. And of course, it didn't happen in this case. So we have, <clears throat> as Ms. Best has said, we have Jane Doe's 1 through 25 and John Doe's 1 through 25. So that is potentially, basically think of them as blank slots that can later be filled in with names once uh, more discovery is done on this case and more names are discovered and the, their uh, level of involvement. So, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Best, you believe that Michelle Dauber is going to be named by name in this lawsuit pretty soon as one of the Jane Doe's and you even said somewhere near the top of the list, because why? Because uh, Michelle Dauber designed the judicial procedure that was used at Stanford that denied um, Katie Ma due process. She is the the orchestrator of the the Title IX directive. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so, so 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 she's the, she's the orchestrator of the 2011 federal unregulated directive Title IX, but she's also the orchestrator of the. Stanford's own judicial process mm -hmm. from 2011 to 2013 and, and maybe afterwards, but certainly during that period. And that period is referenced in the lawsuit um, when complaints were made by students and their families to the department because of denial of their due process rights. So since she was head of that OCS judicial standards committee, at that time, I think it would be highly unusual if she did not appear in this lawsuit as one of those Jane or John Doe's. Understood. <clears throat> um, okay. But I also, I also think she's going to get it from two other areas as well. And the what are those? So the FBI has apparently, according to Susan Bassey, who's a local investigative journalist in the Santa Clara County area and big shout out to her because she has been relentless at pursuing what is going on in Santa Clara County Court and with Michelle Dauber. Um, but she's the one I believe who got the Freedom of Information Act that revealed this, I think it's around 500 emails between Michelle Dauber and the DA's office but going on behind the Brock Turner trial. So uh, the FBI in San Francisco, I believe, has been investigating the Santa Clara County in an, uh, and it's just wrapped their investigation and it's called Operation Mystery Dinner. And Operation Mystery Dinner is a series of, about a series of secret meetings paid for by the public, paid for by the taxpayer, that involved judges, prosecutors, local attorneys, and local newspapers from the Mercury News and so forth, and, and lawmakers. Um, who, and influencers who um, essentially got together in secret and charged the public for these dinners and essentially appear to have rigged juries and rigged trials for profit. And yeah, it's pretty staggering. Holy shit. And Michelle Dorber is involved in this in two ways. She was working very closely with the Mercury News and this guy called Sean Webby, who was in the DA's office, who used to be in the Mercury News, um, which is their local newspaper. And she, uh, you know, was also working directly with the DA and the, the assistant DA. And uh, I believe that she was being investigated for election fraud. So it's pretty serious. Yeah. No, I mean, there's, there's, all, there's, a, there's a very good, and I recommend it to everybody, there's a very good blog called Jane and John Q Public, which I will forward to you. And on that blog, you can read a lot about Michelle Dauber, a lot about the shenanigans at Santa Clara County Court, a lot of what happened behind the scenes of the Emily Doe letter, the Brock Turner letter, and mm -hmm. so forth. Wow. Um... I was not ready for that bombshell. I'm not going to lie. Uh, 
<laughs> so, but obviously, it's not a secret investigation anymore since you know, you know, the title it's, of it. So it's it's not there. secret. They wrap they according to Susan Bassey, they wrapped up their investigation on November twenty third, and there will be indictments by February. Oh, the, just a week ago. Okay, so this is this is hot off the press, literally. Which may be another reason that she deleted her Twitter. Dauber. Yes. Okay, and and then the third the third reason is that yesterday it was announced by Forbes magazine that the Department of Education Office of Civil Rights is investigating Stanford for anti male bias, mm -hmm. and one of the departments it's investigating is her department, the Women's Law Center, or the women. So uh, she's bound to be named in that, and Stanford last. August, August 2021, issued a um, issued a directive about standards of social media communications and standards of decency. And I actually wrote to Stanford in response to that and asking them about their double standards when it came to Michelle Dorber, mm -hmm. because they weren't restricting her for calling for, you know, heinous, you know, acts on or you know naming shaming calling heinous acts on people and yet you know that she violated their own standards but got away with it and i did say i believe in that letter that sooner or later something catastrophic would happen yeah um but here's my question you know deleting twitter is one thing um does she realize that it does not automatically erase history? Like your your trail of tweets is still preserved on the servers. Oh yeah, she like she, she you knows and I very, may not have access to it, but she she more than knows it. Her husband Ken Dorber is uh, allegedly, I think, the ninth hire at Google. He's a Google engineer, and in this trove of emails with Santa Clara County. DA, it says in one of her emails, shall I get Ken to fix it, to like fix the social media? So, and there were whistleblowers at Yahoo, Facebook, um, YouTube, at Google and Twitter, I believe in 2016, that accused Ken and Michelle Dorber of social media manipulation. This rabbit hole just doesn't stop going, does it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. Okay. Um, so, okay. So we should be seeing some serious activity by February if, uh, if, and when these indictments come. Uh, so I guess we have that to look forward to. Uh, in the meantime, the, the lawsuit against, um, Stanford university and their progeny and their employees for, the uh, tragic death of Katie Meyer, that's going to start unraveling slowly but surely. Uh, the Department of Education is now investigating Stanford for its anti-male rhetoric. And also, I believe, uh, it, maybe it was you who sent me something just earlier today that kind of didn't make a lot of sense. Um, Title IX, a Title IX bill to be presented, which broadens the definition of what sexual harassment is to kind of, is that an attempt to backdoor any future issues? Yes. I mean, because yes. now, now you're, aren't you making it worse though? How is that making it better? This is what I don't understand. It's making it worse. So mm -hmm. um, tell us about it. So I think there are four senators and I can't, um, I'm trying to think who they were, but one of them was Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, and there were three other senators who wrote a letter uh, this morning uh, and to support this bill that would um, further um, expand the um, that would further expand the definition of um, sexual assault, and that would apparently deny the presumption of innocence uh, in Title IX cases, which is just staggering. I mean, in any, if you don't go to school, 
if you don't go to college, if you're walking down the street and somebody accuses you of something, you have the assumption of innocence. They're proposing that in schools, colleges, and universities, if you're accused of something, you do not start out with the assumption of innocence. And I find that absolutely abhorrent. Senators Bob Casey and Maisie Hirono will introduce new anti-harassment legislation on Thursday that aims to strengthen Title IX protections for student survivors of sexual assault or harassment. You know, it, they make it sound so genuine and sweet, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Strengthen but, you know, protections, but in the same sense, what you're doing is you're when you broaden the definition, you can now capture more um, people and more people in the funnel that don't belong in the funnel. Yes, exactly. And, you know, I'm shocked that they did this on the back of this national publicity around the Katie Myers suit, because mm -hmm. that suit is all about due process and the fact that it was denied. And if it hadn't been denied, and if she had had the assumption of innocence, she might be alive today. So it's absolutely shocking. Yeah. Um, currently far higher than those applicable workplace. The Title IX plaintiffs required to prove that they were subject to severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive harassment that school administrators were aware of but failed to act on. This act would amend Title IX and other statutes prohibiting sex-based discrimination to remove unreasonably burdensome standards for private harassment lawsuits seeking damages. So many students who endure sexual harassment or assault experience isolation, fear, and difficulty focusing on their education as they process a traumatic ordeal, Casey said Thursday in a statement to The Hill. To add insult to injury, students who report their experiences face an uphill battle to seek justice. We cannot go backwards. Jesus Christ. I mean, the only good thing about this is that somebody could accuse Michelle Dorber for harassing them for all her, her, you know, for threatening, harassing and all her tweets. But, you know, that's, that's not really the goal of what we're looking for. We're looking, we want, we want kids to feel safe. We don't want kids to be silenced and we want kids to be nurtured. And what they're, what, with all of these bills they're trying to pass, they're building a really hostile environment for, for, for students and faculty and their families. Right. And that's not what we want for our students. Mm -mm. Oh, man, I'm so glad that I went to school <laughs> and graduated in 2010 before all of this, because you never know. You never know what net you may be caught in doing absolutely nothing wrong. Like you're saying, Mr. Turner, wrong place, wrong time, completely unexpected situation. Um, I mean, it's just terrifying. It, it's terrifying for males and females alike because, you know, if it's if it's true what you said that even the the female victim said that she did not want to pursue anything because she nothing was 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 wrong. Like she she was the active participant who went and coaxed Mr. Turner to um, engage in in sexual acts, and then now she's the face of. You said she wrote a book. She wrote she wrote a book called Know My Name. Know My Name was was published in a year ago, two years ago, and um, he, she follows. Have you read it? I I've read bits of it, um, okay. and I have read the victim impact statement. I mean, the in my opinion, I and I don't wish ill on Chanel Millat because I think that she was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and so I think that she I think that she was used by Michelle Dorber. Mm -hmm. I think that they, you know, they had a, they had a hookup, you know, that the, there was, you know, yeah, should he not have fingered her? Probably. But I think that she, she, you know, she could have been a willing participant at that point and passed out. Like, we don't know. It's a $64 million question. We don't know. But I don't think you can just assume guilt like that. And, and, and to put it in context, Tara Reid, accused Joe Biden of digital penetration, penetration with a finger. 
in broad daylight in the 1990s when Joe Biden was a senator. Now, whether or not Tara Reid's accusation is true or not, Tara Reid was smeared as a liar for accusing Joe Biden of the very same crime that Brock Turner is a sex offender registrant for life and the target of Michelle Dauber's and her clan's hate, vigilante hatred. But the difference is that Brock Turner was 19. He was a freshman in college. Chanel Miller was 22. And Joe Biden said to Emily Doe, to Chanel Miller, I see you. And allegedly he said to Tara Reid, according to her, um, you're nothing to me. Now, as I say, I'm not assuming that Joe Biden is guilty, but if you can't assume that Joe Biden is guilty, then you can't really assume that Brock Turner is guilty because the entire criminal process for Brock Turner was manipulated for political effect. You can't tell. You can't, you can't tell if anybody is guilty or innocent of a crime unless you have the full deck of cards, the deck of cards that is not influenced by politics. That's heavy. <clears throat> That's very heavy. Let me just uh, go through these real quick. Hey, look at that. Claire Best, welcome as a member on our channel. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for joining. Thank you. Um, thank you. Also, thank you, uh, Sue uh, Brubaker, uh, for joining on as well. Um, Alexander, our, our lovely Alexander, always here, my friend. Uh, good to see you. Uh, I don't have any reason, he says, for this donation. Do you need one? You don't need a reason. This comes from my heart of hearts. Thank you, my friend. From Montreal, thank you so much for this content. You are welcome. You are welcome. Thanks for joining. Uh, Beautifully Damaged says, uh, thank goodness it is about time. Uh, not sure what this is in reference to, but this was a few minutes ago, I guess. This is right about the time when we were talking about the potential indictments and the investigation by the FBI. So I imagine maybe that was what that was in reference to, but please feel free to correct me. Um, and Viking, thank you for the super sticker. Um, well, Claire, uh, I, I really wanted to thank you um, for joining us today. You have been an absolute wealth of information. Well, th thank you so much, Larry, for having me. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in and listening. Um, you know, I care very much in my job. I care very much about people. I have to. And I also have to read the fine print. And um, I think that every family in America needs to wake up and start looking into what the rights are for their children at schools. And are they going to have those rights or are they going to be denied them? There is nothing worse. And I, I know several families who got that phone call from another state in the middle of the night saying that their child had, you know, been accused of this, that or the other. What do they do? And the, and the problem is, is like if you're Johnny Depp, you've got millions of dollars to fight it. If you're a student, you don't have that. So there are over 800 federal lawsuits currently um, of which I think about 300 have been won and, and others settled out of court um, against, you know, for due process. But those are the students who have the money to fight this. You know, I, I'm considered, you know, you know, reasonably wealthy. I don't have the money to go fight, you know, 50,000, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 dollars for a, an attorney to try to fight in a kangaroo court in some, you know, Alice through the looking glass situation. It's ridiculous. Everyone is saying I've been highlighting their comments that you should come back uh, at some point and we'll if you'll have us uh, we'll definitely have you on so. I, I'd be thrilled I'm 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 so grateful that you are highlighting this I know there are an awful lot of other families who are very grateful and um, you know it took Johnny Depp to for the public to see kind of what's going on in this narrative 
and now what's going on it took katie myers to bring it to the attention and i really okay. hope that we all come we can all come together it doesn't matter the political stripes we all in the end i think care about health happiness and the welfare of our children thank you so much claire thank you thanks all for right. joining us thank you well um that was claire best um, you all may remember I read her article on my channel um, not that long ago. I think earlier this week, maybe it was last week. I, I don't exactly recall, but it's on my channel. You can check it out in the playlist in the daily shows, I believe, is where it's located. Um, what a rabbit hole. Uh, definitely not something that I fully anticipated uh, in having Claire on. I know she knows a lot. She has been researching this for a long time and she has uh, people in different places who feed her information, which is very, she's a very unique position. Um, I obviously don't do this full time. And uh, the more I learn, the more shocked and wowed I am. I think we had, how many, how many, oh my God, wow moments did we have today? I, I actually, I, I lost count. I lost count, you know, um, and I, I thought from the beginning, there was no way that Michelle Daubert deleted her Twitter because of me. I did not want to take credit for that because I didn't feel that that was true. Uh, when I made the video about her checkered past, that that just, it didn't seem, it didn't fly right. I knew there was something bigger uh, flying under the radar. And here we are. Now we know it's not even this lawsuit, potentially. It is potential indictments coming her way if it's true you know uh if the fbi has something to pin on her as a as a crime as a federal felony well then indictments may come forward um so yeah i i think i think we all learned a lot and uh i'm very thankful for claire first of all for reaching out because after i did the video she reached out and said she wanted to come on so uh or she she wanted she was thanking me excuse me she thanked me for sharing her article and then i asked her if she would like to come on and she said yes i apologize that's how it went down um so yeah uh very very interesting very unique uh lots of things are going to be changing in the united states of america over the coming months i i it's it's already in the air i mean with this trial we can already see that the um we can already see that the um even i mean the article that we saw senators trying to amend title nine which seems to be a an altruistic move right on it on the surface like we are we want to help more students like who doesn't want to when they hear that phrase we want to help more students who doesn't want to help more students that sounds fantastic. How, what are we doing? Oh, well, we're broadening the definition of what uh, sexual assault means in Title IX actions. Wait, you're doing what now? Yeah, we're, we're making it more so we capture more, more victims and more perpetrators. So, okay, I wouldn't have a problem with it, except we, we literally just discussed, if you go back 40 minutes in this video, we touched upon how the um, due process is completely absent. There's no checks and balance. There's no jury. There's no right to counsel. And you're taking this bastardized process and you're expanding it to include more people. So right up until this point, you had this many potential uh, people whose rights and, and rights are going to be violated and futures destroyed with uh, very limited checks and balance, and now you're going to expand it. So it looks great on the surface, except when the the rotten, uh, when the core is rotten, and you expanding it only brings more destruction all around. So I, I can't wait to see um, what what it, what's going to happen and, and what's gonna go down. Um, this is This is what a time to be alive. You guys, what a time to be alive. Thank you, Tyler G. Says a superb interview. Uh, Nicholas, hey, Nicholas is back. How are you, sir? Uh, Sadin, Sedan 
is known to have the broadest definition regarding sexual assault. But here, but even here, the presumption of innocence is fundamental. Uh, I'm guessing uh, you are referring to, uh, you're somewhere in uh, Scandinavia, right? Sweden, I think. Sweet, uh, maybe, oh, maybe Sedan is, is a typo for Sweden. So uh, I apologize. Sweden, yeah, there he, there he is. Uh, yeah, Sweden. So Sweden is known to have the broadest definitions and even here the presumption of innocence. And that, that is fantastic. The, we do want to capture more perpetrators. You, you know, you do realize I'm on the side of the good guys, right? I know there's a lot of AH stands who are just like, well, this guy is like all about. No, he's not. No, he's not. He's about justice and about rights and people having their constitutional rights protected. I am a criminal defense attorney. I, we like to call ourselves ever so pompously, mind you, gatekeepers of the Constitution. That's what we do. And so when you when I see people and Claire said it best, no pun intended, uh, Claire said it best when she said she is there for the people. That is what I do on a daily basis. Only I do it in the courtroom. She does it in exposing the truth to the world. We are in the same profession at the end of the day is to get justice and truth out to people. So um, I, I very much I very much appreciate you all joining me. This was. This was absolutely phenomenal. Probably the best interview, I think, that we've had on this channel to date. So uh, I hope to do many more of these in the future. No question about it. Um, it is an art, you know, asking questions and um, knowing when to shut up <laughs> uh, is is definitely a, a skill. And it, it sometimes for an attorney, it takes a lot to master. But I'm trying. I'm trying and I think I think I did a good job. I don't know. Tell me in the comments below. Um, tomorrow, what are we doing tomorrow? Tomorrow, tomorrow, I have no idea. We'll see what, what comes our way. Uh, we'll do something fun. We'll uh, we may look at the complaint. Um, I mean, the complaint is very lengthy. Uh, I'm all, of course referring to the Katie Meyer complaint against Stanford. It's very lengthy. It's got like 500 paragraphs. It's like 72 pages. We may even like skip around, maybe skip past the parties. I mean, the entire like first 20 pages, I believe, is like all an introduction into the. But we, we don't want to skip over the fact. So we may go over that. Uh, it's just it's going to be completely exhausting to to go through the complaint start to finish uh, for both of us, not just me. Um, but other than that, um, Monday, Monday. So tomorrow is the due date for Amber Heard to file her response to Johnny Depp's appeal brief, opening brief that he filed. Remember, I know it's been like a month, so you all may not remember, but um, the uh, the brief, opening brief and Johnny Depp's appeal with respect to the uh, Depp Waldman statement issue, which is the only issue that he's appealing because it's the only thing that he lost on, um, confusing the jury that the jury did not understand what Depp Waldman means. So that is going to be filed tomorrow. And just to be on the safe side, I already scheduled a um, stream for Monday. So even if I get my hands on it on Friday, we're doing something very, very, very special. Okay. I have been personally reached out to by YouTube, and I have been working with YouTube to beta test a brand new functionality that has never before been seen on the YouTube platform. I have no idea why they picked me. I'm just little old DUI guy over here. But hey, they offered, they said, do you want to be the guinea pig? And I said, sure, I'll be the guinea pig. So they offered the... Uh, opportunity. I jumped on it and we are going to do that uh, on Monday. Uh, so you will see when um, uh, when we go live. I think it's at two o'clock Eastern. So it'll be 11 a.m. Pacific and then like, I don't know, nine o'clock in Europe somewhere sometime there. Um, looking forward to that. And uh, lots more content for you guys. I'm trying to get uh, Nick. Nick is very, very busy. You know, Nick Ricada. Um, I'm trying to get him on the channel just to, to have some fun. Uh, I've been on his channel. Now it's his turn to come on mine. So we'll see if I can get him uh, hopefully next week. 
And uh, yeah, we're just going to keep this train going. Thank you, Beautifully Damaged, uh, who says your intelligence and knowledge of the law shines through. Oh, you're so sweet. You're so sweet. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining me. I love you guys. Don't forget to like this video, comment below, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you all tomorrow. Bye, everybody.